had a, uh, an absolutely awesome time with the teens yesterday playing uh, slip and slide kickball. It was a first for me, and um, so we all got our weekly bath, which uh, that was pretty neat. I'm just kidding. Uh, but we just wanted to take a moment and introduce ourselves to the rest of you. I'm going to go ahead and start with myself. My name is Maxwell Barker, and I am from the small town of Lake Odessa, Michigan. Hello, my name is Ben Cecilliano, and I'm from the small town of Los Angeles, California. All the way from Big Sky Country, I'm from Montana, and my name is Tori House. Hello, my name is Amy Conklin, and I'm from Bend, Oregon. And over at the piano, we have Grace D'Amico, and she's from Claremont, Florida. To see the dawn of the darkest day. On the road to Calvary, tried by sinful men, torn and beaten, then nailed to a cross of wood. Oh, to see the pain written on your face.
thank you for allowing us to come to your house today, Lord. And I thank you for the Pensacola Tour Group. Lord, I pray that you just help them to continue to be a blessing to the people across the United States, Lord. Lord, I just pray that you just uh, bless this offering that we're about to take up for you. Help us to honor and glorify you. In your name we pray.
Become like you, 
Thank you so much. Turn to Luke chapter 15. They have a table in the back. I encourage you to go back there after service and speak with them. Y'all have some CDs back there? Man, look, parents, I cannot encourage you enough to get good music in your home. Music is a vehicle. It, it takes you places, all right? And the right kind of music will take you to a place of prayer it'll take you to a place of meditating on the Lord and what he's done it'll take you to a place of thanksgiving um, listen that'll do a lot more for you than Leonard Skinner will I know you don't believe it alright do a lot more for you than Maroon 5 and, and, and Monsoon and, and some of those well I heard of a group five finger death punch boy now that sounds edifying doesn't it I don't know but look get you some good music in your home Get you some good music in your car. Uh, some of the sweetest times I have alone with the Lord are in my vehicle. And a lot of times it starts off with some good music that just brings me right into his presence. Before long I have to turn the music off and just focus totally on him. And sometimes the tears are flowing. Sometimes it might blow a snot bubble. Sometimes I, I just get all wound up and I about tear my steering wheel off having a good time with the Lord. Years ago, I, I went to that college and I went with the teens to a, a, a rest home, nursing home. And I remember this one old lady as we were preaching and singing there at the rest home. This one old lady, she had her, she was sitting in a wheelchair and had an afghan pulled over her head. I mean, she was all covered up. And, but she was just kind of rocking in there and one of the workers went by and lifted it up and said are you okay she said oh yes me and the Lord having a good time up in here she is all alone with the Lord and boy you need that every day in your life Luke chapter 15 Luke chapter 15 I'm going to go ahead and put the traveling mic on Luke chapter 15 and we'll start, well, as soon as I turn away from Mark 15 and over to Luke 15, that's when we'll start. Matthew, Mark, Luke is the next book. Okay, here we go. Start in verse number 11. If you don't mind, let's all stand, please, for the reading of the Word of God. You follow along here. Now, we're going to read 11 through 32. If you have knee palms, hip problems, back problems, and you need to sit down, that's fine. I understand. And he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. Not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, there wasted his substance with riotous living. When he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat. And no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. And am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. He arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven. And in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. 
But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. Now his elder son was in the field. As he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. And he was angry, would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him, and answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment, and yet thou never gavest me a kid that I, may, that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. <clears throat> and he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad, for this thy brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost and is found. Let's pray. Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for salvation, your mercy, your grace. Lord, we desperately need you this morning. As we're studying your word, please give us open minds, open hearts to receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. For some time now, on Sunday mornings, we've been going through the book of Luke. Luke is that gospel that shows most the humanity side of Christ. And as one who uh, professes to believe, be a believer and who desires to be a Christian or Christ-like, we need to study Christ, see what he did, where he walked, how he carried himself the things he said. If I want to be like him, I've got to study him. So we've been going through the book of Luke. Two Sundays ago, we started in chapter 15, and we saw that the public and sinner, publicans and sinners drew near to hear him. And we saw that the Pharisees murmured against him and said, this man receives publicans and sinners. And remember, their reasoning was that Holiness tries to separate, or righteousness separates itself from that which is wicked. And, and they're saying, if this is the most righteous of all, then what is he doing uh, gathering to himself publicans and sinners? They were trying to besmirch his, uh, his reputation, his testimony. They were trying to uh, uh, cast an ill light on Jesus Christ, saying, look, if he's hanging around that kind, then that must be the kind that he is. Jesus then follows up with three stories. One is of a lost sheep and the shepherd leaving the 90 and 9 in the fold to go find the lost sheep. And when they find that, when he finds that lost sheep, oh, he puts it on his neck and carries it back and he rejoices and he, he calls people to him and, hey, celebrate with me. I found this lost sheep. He then told the story of the lady who lost that one talent and how she swept the house and and she searched the house, I mean, uh, uh, sort of like in my house, searching for the television remote. Because nobody puts it back in the same place ever. And yes, I'm bitter about it. The man, she sweeps that house, she's removing the dirt, she's looking for that coin, she looks under the chairs, looks under the tables, looks everywhere, and finally she finds that one coin. Now she had nine more, but she finds that one coin, and she begins to celebrate, and she calls her friends, and she says, hey, this one coin that I've lost, I found it, rejoice with me. Now he comes to this story here of the prodigal son. This man with two sons, and once again it's followed in the same vein of teaching the importance of that one sinner. Boy, I'm glad that our God is not just a God of the populace, He's a God of the individual. My God knows me by name. He is a personal God. 
He knows more about me than I know about myself. He knows my needs before I realize my needs. He knows my thoughts while they're yet afar off. I have a personal God who is indeed my very best friend. He wants to be that for you as well. And he tells this story now about this man that had two sons and the younger son came to the dad and said, Dad, give me my portion of the inheritance now. The dad does so and the boy goes out and wastes all of his substance with riotous living till he comes to the point where he has nothing. And he makes his way back home. I want to look at a couple things here about this prodigal and this, uh, this prodigal son. I, I want to look first at the progression he made. First, there was a desire for independence from the father. It wasn't just the normal desire of a young man that wants to begin his family. This was a desire to be totally independent from the family that he had. Perhaps friends had, had told him that he was too attached to his mother's apron strings. Maybe they had told him, look, you're just a mama's boy. You need to get out and experience the world. Perhaps that he thought there were some worldly delights that he was missing out on. And, and boy, he, he longed to go see those things. And so he says to his father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. Man, now this is really a blatant act of disrespect. It's almost as if he hoped his father's death would hasten so that he could, he could get the possessions that would come to him. Now, Jesus, when he came speaking these parables and preaching, he often turned society up, upside down and turned the religious traditions upside down. And he does so here because in this context, in this society, a, a, a father normally would not have taken that. He would have rebuked his son. He might have even wrapped him on top of the head. And nevertheless, we find the father here who's a picture of God. He extends mercy and he extends grace and he, he gives in. He says, okay, I'll give you your portion of goods. Now, it doesn't seem to be that maybe his intentions were to waste all of his money. There's no indication that he, he planned to sp spend everything that he had in sinful living. He, he just starts out, I, I want my independence. I want to do it my way. I want to do what I want to do when I want to do it. Perhaps he desired for himself to have the liberty to make his own choices. He wanted to exercise his own free will and choose his own master. And that's where it started. I, I want to do what I want to do. And then it, it progressed to a separation. He got the goods and he realized that if I remain at home or near my father, it's going to be as if my wings have been clipped. My father's going to keep me in check, so to speak. You know, there's something dangerous about the thrill of sin. The Bible tells us that there are, there are pleasures in sin, and that, but that, those pleasures are for a season. And, and look, don't make the, the mistake of telling your children when uh, they're being tempted to do something, oh, don't do that, it's no fun. Now, don't lie to them. You'll, you'll lose their trust. There, uh, listen, there are some things out there that are fun, but boy, there's a danger to it. And there is always a payment to be paid. And boy, there's this thrill he sees of, of going out and doing some things. The, the daring For the daring heart, there's a thrill in finding out, boy, I've heard that these things are dangerous and I've, I've heard about this one that couldn't handle it and I've heard about that one that couldn't handle it, but I wonder if I could handle it. I don't think that would ever happen to me. How many of you, you don't have to raise your hand, but how many of you adults remember as you were a, a young man, fellas, and you thought, boy, I tell you, that alcohol won't get the best of me. I can control it. And those drugs won't get the best of me. I can control them. And that stuff that I'm viewing on the Internet at night when everybody else is asleep, it won't get the best of me. It won't control me. I'll control it only to have it come back and bite you and put its hooks into you 
deep enough that you have a whole lot of trouble shaking them. Then we see that all is spent. Start out, I just want to do what I want to do. I want to do it my way. He separates himself from the Father. He ends up in that foreign land. And by and by, everything is spent. And let me mention to you that this is what sin, this is a natural progression of sin. This, I want to do it my way. I'm my own man. I'm the captain of my own fate. I can do what I want to do. When I was in college, it seemed like every semester near the end, uh, a, a group of people would lose their mind and do the most stupid thing. And you know why they wanted to do them? Just to see if they could. Well, this will be fun if we don't get caught. Man, I, I, I had this, I knew this one guy, he wasn't a friend, he was an acquaintance. But the last day of the semester, man, he had us, the whole semester, he had hidden in his room a half stick of dynamite. The last day of the semester, he thought, this will be fun. And he opens his window, he lights it, and he throws it in the parking lot. Kaboom! He almost got kicked out on the last day, almost lost the whole semester. I was a floor leader. One of them old, mean old floor leaders. And I remember uh, one time, 16. Individuals, I, I, I got word that, hey, 16 people just got in trouble. Now, if you're a floor leader, you know that means you're about to have what they call a shadow. They're going to stick them beside. They still do that, have shadows. They, not anymore. Well, praise God for them floor leaders. And if you're a floor leader, what you do then is you get away from the telephone, you go up on the uh, whatever floor of the library, and you hide at the back where nobody can find you. You don't want one. These had gone out now at a Christian college, and some of them are very good people. Well, they had gone out, they got involved in some drinking, got involved in some, some, some drugs. And one person came back and said, hey, guess what we did? Boy, it got around next thing, you know, all 16 of them had got kicked out. Now, they just started out, boy, I, I, I'm tired of these rules, and, and I just want to get out and spread my wings, want to do my own thing. And they, they separated themselves from what was safe. They separated themselves from what was right. And then sin takes you to the part where all is spent, all character is spent, all strength is spent, all health is wasted, all dignity is lost. All hope is removed. All uprightness is abandoned. Anything that was worth anything, sin will rob you of it. It will take it from you. And afterwards, there's always this terrible hunger. And life becomes a labor to find something that will satisfy that hunger. Back in Charlotte, I had some friends I, I uh, at our church, and I, I worked with an addictions program there at our church, and uh, I had some friends that were uh, crack cocaine addicts. And they said that first time was the best. And every time after that, they said it, it created a hunger, and, and when you come off of it, he said we, we feel dirty, and, and we feel just wasted, and we think, why do we do that? I'll never do it again. But it created a taste for it. That created a hunger, and he said, after that, we, boy, I'd be out somewhere, and they'd start calling to me. I think, well, I, I, I'm empty. I, I need something. I, I can't handle a life like this anymore. I, I know what I, I'll go back and see if I can get what I got before. And he said, and no matter how much you do and how often you do it, you never get what you're wanting because sin leaves you hungry, and it leaves you empty. It often leads to a greater degradation. The, he, now we find this, this boy, he's gone out, he's separated himself from his father because, hey, I want to do what I want to do, and I want to do it when I want to do it, and, and there's some things out there that I want to experience that my dad is not going to let me experience, and boy, I'm going to get my inheritance, and I'm going to go out there and experience them, and now we find him, a, a famine is in the land, he's out of money, he goes to his friends, look, boy, I footed the bill for you when we had those parties, can you help me out? They shut the door in his face, now he goes and joins his, himself to 
a Gentile who, who's a, a pig farmer, and he says, look, is there anything I can do? Sure, you can feed the swine. Or this Jewish boy who it was a, 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 a a bad thing to work for a Gentile and it was a, a, a bad thing to associate with the, the swine, the pigs and now he finds himself feeding the pigs and he's so hungry the Bible says he, he looks at the food the husk that the, the, the swine are eating and he thinks boy, I'd sure like to have some of that I'm so hungry if I could just eat a little bit of that, and yet he's not even able to eat that. Listen, sin will bring your judgment out of order. Sin, when you yield to sin and you begin to take that path, serious mistakes will be made in regard to the all-important matters. Sin is a destroyer. The here and now are usually thought to be worth all the thoughts and labors so no, the eternal matters are all put to the rear. It was when he felt that his craving or felt the, that craving that he could not satisfy that finally this young man as he's there feeding the swine and looking at him and saying, boy, I'm starving. I, boy, I'd love to reach down and get a handful of that, but I can't, boy. The, the owner of these pigs, that he'd get mad at me, he'd fire me, and boy, I, I wish I could eat some of what the pigs are eating. When he, he's there in that moment, that despair, that degradation, I mean, he is humiliated. He's lost it all. The Bible says he came to himself. Well, that's a wonderful time in the life of a person. His interest had become far from his father's interest. He left his good home. Evidently, his father was not too hard of a man. When he asked, Father, would you give me my inheritance, he actually acquiesced. and He, he didn't rebuke him. He didn't slap him down. He, he didn't send him away empty. Left his good home. Thought the grass was greener on the other side. You've heard it said before, the grass isn't greener. It's just artificial turf over there. Now his pockets were drained. And don't you know that now as he's looking down in that trough where the, the hogs are eating, he thinks, boy, what in the world <clears throat> was I thinking? I must have lost my mind. I, I, I've lost, I spent it all. I, I, I should have realized when I was halfway through it that, hey, you need to slow down, buddy. You need to do something. But no, he didn't stop there. He just spent it all. He wasn't carefully putting nothing back. Sin does not beckon us to partake in moderation, and most can't. I read where a guy said, uh, I, I can uh, drink not at all, or I can drink a lot, but I can't drink just a little. I had his hooks in him. <clears throat> Sin is just that intoxicating. Sin draws the heart away just like that. His madness is seen in that he could have gone home immediately when he realized, boy, hey, man, I'm eating, or I'm wanting to eat what the pigs are eating. But he didn't go back to his father. Perhaps it was his desire to remain independent even at that point. Well, I'm, not, I'm not going back. I, I've got my independence and I want to do what I want to do. Perhaps it, the, it was that he did not want to be shamed. But he comes to himself. What a wonderful point in, in life for a sinner. In Luke 15, 18 through 19, let's look at it again. Here's what he said. I, I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. Oh, when he comes to himself, he has a change of heart. He has a change of attitude. <clears throat> before, his, before he left, his words were, Give me. Now he returns. His words are, make me. 
make me as one of thy hired servants. He left with a selfish demand, but now he's wasted it all. He comes to himself and he returns home with not a selfish demand, but a humble prayer. He begins to make his way home, maybe begging from house to house to get enough food to last the next day. No longer clothed in his, his uh, fine robes that he left in. He's all hocked off the, the, rig, the signet ring for uh, showing the authority he had within his household. No longer shod with the nice uh, uh, shoes of a landowner. His feet are, are now bloody and scarred from walking the roads. Now I want you to look at verse number 20. In verse number 20, And he arose and came to his father, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him. Well, now what a picture of God we have here versus a picture of us as the prodigal. We have this picture of God that while this son was walking down the road, he's yet a great way off, and his father sees him. It's not just a casual observance he marked him as only a father can do. He sees his son in the distance, maybe just a small silhouette coming down the road, and yet that father knows the, the build of his son, and he knows the, the swagger of his son, and he knows how his son walks, and he, he, he can tell by the way he holds his shoulders and holds his head, hey, I know who that is right there. That's my boy. It was with an eye of love and affection that he saw him. It's as though his father had been looking for him. And look what it says there in verse number 20. When he saw him and had compassion. Compassion, it means to suffer with. He put himself into his son's rags and put himself into his son's bare feet and he pitied him. The suffering of the son caused the father to suffer as well. <clears throat> if you're a father, you know, you know how that is. Well, when my children suffer, I hurt right with them. Well, when they were babies, my, my oldest son was a baby for the first 16 months. He suffered from ear infections and, and had the colic. And boy, about two in the morning, he had begun to cry. And it was a different cry than the cry of hunger. Is that cry of pain. And you go and pick him up and you try to comfort him. And boy, they, they're, he's just crying. He's in this pain. And there's, there's nothing I could do. And oh, it didn't make my ears hurt, but it sure made my heart hurt. Sometimes with having five boys, and, and, and of course there's, disappointments come into their life and boy when they get disappointed boy I, I hurt right along with them I, that's that's compassion the suffering of the son caused the father to suffer as well now look what he did and had compassion and what did he do next he ran he ran why why do you think he ran well now in our society we understand that he's glad to see this was not typical of first century Palestine. These men like this, these landowner men, they, they didn't run. It was an undignified thing to do. They would send the servants and the servants would run, but, but not the master. To run, the master would have to pull up his robe and, and, and expose his bare legs. And in, at that point of time in that society, that was a, a, a thing that was undignified. It was shameful. In first century Palestine, there was a tradition that if a son went off and a Jewish son went off and lost his inheritance in any way amongst the Gentiles, and then he tried to come back home, this tradition is called, I don't know if I pronounce it right, but Kazaza, K E Z A Z A H. If the community saw the son coming home and they had already gotten wind, Boy, he went out and he lost his inheritance among the Gentiles. They would meet the son as the son was coming back into the community and they would take a clay pot and they would break it in front of him and say, you are now cut off from your people. 
And he'd be cut off from the whole community. He'd be rejected by the village. And so the father, perhaps, he realizes, man, hey, that's my son. If the rest of the people of our village, if the rest of the people of our community and city see him, they're going to go out and they're going to cut him off. And so to, to spare his boy from that, who his boy had deserved it, he pulls up his robe, he exposes those legs, and he does what is undignified for a man of his station to do. He runs to his son, taking his son's shame, ta- uh, uh, casting his dignity aside, and he runs and he falls on his son and he embraces him and he begins to hug him and to smother him with kisses. the village would have followed the running father and seen what was done. When they saw the father accept the son, there would be no cutting off that day. There would be no rejection that day. He had been accepted back as a son. He fell on his neck and he kissed him. Smothered him with kisses. Here's this older man. We see him run. Now remember, he's a picture of God, the Father. We see him running, sacrificing his dignity, and smothering his son with kisses who had wasted all his goods amongst the heathen. Wait, he wasn't clean yet. He still had on those tattered rags. He still didn't have shoes on his feet and they were bloody and dirty and and he still didn't have a ring on his finger and and boy, maybe his hair was long and matted and dirty and maybe he still smelled like the hogs he worked with. This is what the Pharisees were accusing Jesus of. They were saying, wait a minute, you're, you're righteous but you're letting these filthy sinners Come and eat with you. Boy, at this time, the the thing would have been, no, the father is to stay at the house and wait for the son to come to him. And then once the son gets there, you send him and get him cleaned up. And you get him dressed, make him look presentable. I'm not going to touch him, and and I don't want him to to soil my robes. Let's clean him up first, and, and then maybe let's put him on probation. Let's give him a little bit of time to see if he's really sincere. And, and, and But no, that's not the way Christ did it. And the father ran to him, and he falls on his neck, and he hugs his son, and he embraces him, and that, the smell of the swine are now rubbing off on the father. And the dirt is now dirtying his robes. And he smothers him with kisses and he said, Hey, you've come back. I'm accepting you as my son. And by the way, let me say, salvation is just that easy. Jesus Christ did all the work, all the work. And no matter how dirty and filthy in sin a man, woman, or child is, if they will simply go to the Father, placing their faith in Jesus Christ, He says, Thou shalt be saved. Well, aren't you glad that the Bible doesn't say we have to clean ourselves up first? We could never be clean enough. I'm glad He didn't say, Well, tell you what, if you can go about three months without sinning, well, sometimes I have problems going three minutes. Man, if I had to go three months on a probationary period, boy, I tell you what, every one of us would be in sorry shape, wouldn't we? <clears throat> the father's attitude was left. Look, just let me get my arms around him. Let me bring his head to my chest. Let me smother him with kisses. And this is just what the father does to the sinner who comes to him. Pastor, I could never be used of God. I can't ever, I, I could never be saved. Man, you just don't know. I've lived a bad life. I'm filthy. Hey, look, you can't be that bad. Father says, no, just let me put my arms around him. Just come to me. Notice in verse 21, remember the son had a plan, what he's going to say. He's going to go back and say, look, I'm I'm not worthy to be uh, uh, your son. Just make me as one of your servants. Remember that? He doesn't even get to finish the speech he prepared. 
He says, And the Son said unto the Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy Son. And remember what he's going to say next? Just make me one of your hired servants and let me eat at their table. He didn't even get to finish. And, and, and the Father says, Hey, shh, hey, none of that. Bring forth the best robe. It's the dress of a son. Notice the son says, Father, I have sinned. And the father says, hey, bring forth the best robe. The robe met his condition of needing clothing. He says, hey, bring a, 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 a ring to put on his hand. He restores the honor of sonship to the son. It, it was a signet. It, it gave man power over property. And remember, the son said, I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. And the dad says, hey, put a ring on his finger. And shoes on his feet in the east, the servants usually didn't wear shoes. It was the father and son that wore sandals. Remember the son's idea was to say, make me as one of thy servants. But the dad says, no, no, bring him some shoes to put upon his feet. And bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us make merry. There's another Semitic custom. That when a son had left and returned, whether he left for good or bad reason, but when the son returned, they would get the fatted calf. It was a calf that had been set aside for a special occasion. When the son would return, it was something some call a threshold sacrifice. They would take that fatted calf to the threshold. The threshold was considered a holy spot in the home. And they would actually offer the sacrifice. They would kill the fatted calf right there at the threshold. There was two reasons for it. One was to atone for possible sins. Another reason was because, hey, now our son is home and it's time to celebrate. <clears throat> the past of the prodigal at that, at that moment when that sacrifice is made and the celebration begins, the past of the prodigal would be forgiven would not be held against him. There would be no rejection. There would be no cutting off the son that was lost. Now as he steps across the threshold where that sacrifice had been made, where the fatted calf had been killed, now that son was back home with all the honors of being a son. Let me ask you a couple questions here. Do you, do you desire to be closer to God? Now think about that question before you go answer it. Do you really desire to be closer to God? I mean, individually, personally, do you desire to be close to God? Then just come to Him. That's it, He's looking. You're not saved. Maybe there's never been a time in your life where you've accepted Christ as your Savior. You say, boy, I'd like to be saved. I want to be a child of God. I want to go to heaven. I want my sins forgiven. Then just come. Maybe you're saved, but you've drifted away. You've sought your own independence. You're doing things your way. You say, man, I, I used to be close to God. I remember when I enjoyed praying. I remember when I enjoyed praising Him and worshiping Him. I remember when I wanted to read the Word and I remember when I wanted to spend some time with Him and oh, I remember how He would comfort me and I, I remember how He would strengthen me and I, oh man, that was wonderful. I remember that joy He gave me in the, even in the midst of trials. Boy, I want that again. Then just come. Just come to the Father. He's waiting. He's looking. Say, I have nothing to bring. And the father will say, no, 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 don't hear that. Bring forth the best robe. If I'm filthy in my sin, no, no, he'll place a ring of sonship on your finger. I'm not able to come. I'm weary and I'm torn. Oh, but he will place upon your feet shoes of grace. And we see the elder son. The elder son comes and he says to a servant, what's going on? Hey, your, your brother has returned. Man, this servant is excited. Your brother's returned. Your father's killed the fatted calf. We're making merry. Come on in. He says, no, go get my father. The father comes out. Yes, sir. What are you doing? 
your son, what do you call him, my brother? Said, your son went out and, and spent all his goods with harlots and, and in all kinds of wickedness, and now he's come home and you reward him with a fatted calf? You've never even killed just a little kid for me to have a party with my friends. By the way, the, the fatted calf is not so much a picture of reward for the son, it's just a picture of grace by the father. You see, this son, oldest son, he was devoted to his father's law. He, he was devoted to his father's service, much like the Pharisees were. But we, he was entirely out of sympathy with the father's heart. And he said, I will not go in. I will not enter the feast. Uh, there would be no forgiveness or mercy on his part. For him to go in to step across that threshold would be to say, okay, I'll not hold it against you anymore. But uh, we never find out if he did. But if he didn't, <clears throat> he's saying, no, I'm not going to be forgiving. The Pharisees, the religious, they were devoted to the law. They were devoted to service. But they were void of sympathy when the with the Father's heart as it was demonstrated in Jesus Christ. Hey, listen, you're saved. You've been saved for a while. You've been going to church. You know how to walk, talk, dress, talk the language. You know when to stand up, sit down. I mean, you know how to be righteous and holy. But who is it you should be running to? Hey, don't be like those Pharisees. Don't be like that older brother. Oh, don't you see? He just looks like he wouldn't smell too good. That guy looks like he has some problems. Boy, that lady, uh, boy, I, 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 she has a very bad reputation, a very soiled reputation. Boy, we don't need to, we don't need to let her come into the church. We don't need to let her come meet with us. No, we should be running to them with open arms. Hey, look, we're, we're, instead of doing vacation Bible school this year, we're going to do Bible clubs. Instead of going out and bringing a few kids here, we're going to go out where they live, out in the projects. Yeah, out, out where they're dirty, where their nose is running. Y'all still have extensions on Saturday? Anybody still go to Truman Arms? Never heard of Truman Arms? Boy, it was dangerous back then. We'd go out to Truman Arms on Saturday morning, me and a bunch of other guys. Projects area. We picked up them little dirty kids. Yeah, dirty. I mean, they were dirty. We'd set them on our neck and ride them around on our neck. And the kids said, let me ride on your neck. Let me ride on your neck. We'd pick them up by an arm and a foot and swing them around. They'd say, swing me again. They'd see a police officer. They'd say, popos. And boy, they were gone. The police would go by. They'd come back out. We'd play with them. I had a roommate in college. from a very wealthy family. My roommate, I said to him, man, you ought to come out there with him. Man, we'd share the gospel with those kids. We'd play basketball for teenagers and adults. We'd, we'd uh, uh, preach to them. We'd, we'd witness to them. We'd win some to Christ. I told my roommate, I said, hey, you ought to come out with him. Out here on extension. And this is, his, well, I'm going to leave out a word. But he said, no. Those snotty nose, use the word there, can go to hell for all I care. He said, I'm not, I'm not putting them on my shoulders. They, they may dirty my clothes. But Jesus said, throw your arms around them. Show them the grace of Who is it you should be running to, Christian? Who is it you should be reaching out to? Maybe it's that co-worker with such a filthy mouth. Say, I'm not getting around that guy. I don't see Jesus doing that. I see Jesus coming up on the break and saying, hey, can I sit here? Showing him grace and loving him in spite of his sin. To whom should you be showing the grace of and compassion that typifies 
the heart of God. Look, maybe you're in here and you're away from God. Maybe you're lost or maybe you're saved. You're just backslid. You say, well, I'd like to be close to God again. Then listen to me. Listen to me. Come on. Just come on. You're not saved. I'll get a man or a lady to take the word of God. They'll take you to a room out here and they'll show you how you can know 100% for sure you're on your way to heaven. You're saved, but you've strayed away from God. Look, you come down here, somebody will pray with you. They'll go out there, pray. they'll pray here with you. They'll go pray with you in the car. They'll go pray with you in the bathroom if you want to. But hey, you need to get right and get close to God. Just come to Him. And then church, let's make sure we're not the ones like the Pharisees that are saying, oh, you're associating with them? No, let's reach out to those that are the sinners. They start coming this way, man. Let's embrace them and let's smother them with the love of God and bring them to the Savior. Amen? Let's bow our head and close our eyes, please.